Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 125 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Life's Greatest Lesson, an interview with Carly Taylor. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatella. Matt, Carly Taylor is this uber-talented Connecticut Yankee residing in Atlanta, Georgia with her husband. Unfortunately, she did grow up in Connecticut, a tick endemic community, and when she left, she took her Lyme disease with her. So, Rich, I'm always looking for Lyme hacks when we interview people on our podcast, and Carly gave us so many Lyme hacks throughout this interview. The first Lyme hack she talked to us about was the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and how that was her game changer to heal from Lyme disease. She also gave us a wide variety of tips to manage headaches from Lyme disease. I think the wonderful thing about Carly Taylor is she's turned this very difficult experience into something that's very positive, so much so that she's actually described her Lyme disease journey as her life's greatest lesson. So Matt, I'm really excited to introduce to the Tick Boot Camp community, Carly Taylor. Hey, Carly Taylor, and welcome to the program. Hi. We are so excited to have you, Carly. So tell us uh, where you're calling in from. I am calling in today from Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, and is Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, I can say that. And is Atlanta, Georgia, the place where you grew up or did you grow up somewhere else? Uh, I actually grew up in Connecticut. So a small town near the capital of Hartford. So it's uh, called Weathersfield, Connecticut. Oh, so you are from, or you hail from the place where uh, Lyme disease first appeared. Yes, exactly. Right. So I think that's, <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be an important part of this conversation, but we'll hold off on that for a second. So tell us when you, uh, when you were ultimately diagnosed with Lyme disease. So there's a couple parts to this. I was first, I first saw a positive test when I was 24. So that was about six years ago. Uh, that was just a positive test after um, multiple positive ANA tests. So they, my doctor knew there was something autoimmune going on or my body was responding that way. Nothing really happened with that. We just thought it was Lyme. I maybe just got bit. Being in Connecticut, it was kind of more of a common thing. So I was treated just really quickly with antibiotics and the symptoms that I were ha was, was having at that time, just fatigue, uh, general things, not, not anything too intense. Uh, went away. Um, well, what I know now probably just went in hiding. And then when I was 26, about two years later, after moving, moving and a bunch of stressful life situations, uh, symptoms came back pretty strong, not knowing what was wrong. And then uh, like a lot of people hopping from doctor to doctor, where I finally was able to get a positive uh, test that we knew was more chronic Lyme when I was 26. So this was about four years ago now. Okay, so now let's walk back to your childhood in Connecticut. Uh, tell us about what your life was like as a child in Connecticut. So I had, I had an amazing childhood. I have two sisters. I'm a middle child, uh, which through the story will be pretty important because I am a uh, very much a middle child, exactly what they say. <laughs> so um, just overachiever, had to kind of be in the spotlight, uh, just, just, that was just like part of me. Uh, I couldn't help it. I always just wanted to do like the biggest thing. Um, and I have an older sister, younger sister. Um, my parents are happily married. It was just a amazing childhood. Um, but kind of through childhood, I always just had to like be the best, uh, which is just like a really big part of my story. And I would put a lot of stress on myself and, um, just had anxiety since I was in kindergarten um, out of no part of my childhood, uh, kind of from a lot of my diving deep into what is going on emotionally. It's just, I think it's just something that is just like part of me and uh, all through childhood and, you know, high school and everything. I just was always stressing myself out and having anxiety attacks and just, um, wanting to, you know, be that A student uh, and captain the cheerleading team and just all of that. So, so you were um, just driven. You, you, you were a driven young person and, and you pushed yourself constantly in part because you're a middle child, probably in part because it would drive your father crazy as the father of four daughters, I can tell you. Um, every <laughs> yes. single bit of anxiety you felt, your father felt uh, 
in spades and uh you know it was just uh a you were a driven young person so what were yeah. you driving toward i mean what were your goals that you were working so so hard to achieve during this phase of your life so i um i was always really in love with dancing i was a dancer since i was gosh like six maybe six years old um I was a dancer my whole life and then I got really into cheerleading um, through through college and then kind of out of college I always had this goal to cheer professionally dance professionally which was a really big part of my life especially after uh, uh, in college and then after college um, but at the same point in college I always wanted to you know be the best so I was wanting to work in television and I was really into like E! News and, and celebrity life. And I just wanted to interview celebrities and be in that world. I was very much like into the entertainment world. Um, so that was a huge part of my professional uh, goals of what I wanted to do. And then um, I also just really wanted to be a professional NFL cheerleader. My family is very into the NFL. My dad has season tickets to the Patriots. Um, I'm, so so, I'm we... sorry to hear that as a Giants <laughs> fan that does uh, cause another <laughs> split here, Carly. <laughs> yeah, being in Atlanta, it did too. But um, yeah, so it was like a big part of my life. So that's what I really wanted to do. And, and it was it was everything I trained for. Um, kind of see through my story on how a lot of that got stopped. So Carly, let's talk about growing up in Connecticut, the birthplace and the namesake uh, city uh, for Lyme disease is in Connecticut. When you were growing up, uh, what did you know about ticks and what did you know about Lyme disease? Honestly, I didn't know much. All we really knew was that you would check for ticks or if you saw one, you would want to get it off. And there was always the story of like what burning it off or um, picking it off. We always, I always knew from uh, a young age to use tweezers, which I know is kind of rare because there's always like those wives tales of burning it off or whatnot. But it wasn't, chronic Lyme was never a thing. No one ever talked about it. Not even from my first diagnosis, uh, it never was. My whole family's from Connecticut um, and, a, and a big part of later of what I found out was when my cousin had chronic Lyme, which we can get into in a bit, is, is what really like stirred that up. But growing up, I mean, looking back, it's, it's crazy that we just really didn't know much about it, even being in Connecticut. Um, being in the woods, we went camping a lot with my family uh, on family reunions, which is where we think probably a tick bite happened. Um, we would just check because we'd be in the woods, but there was never just like a big concern about like watch out for ticks. It was never just like a, you know, something in the forefront of our minds. Now, during the course of the time that you went through the educational system in Connecticut, were there any courses or any elements of your health classes where you were trained about checking yourself for ticks and ultimately what steps you should take in the event that you find a tick? No, not at all. I don't think that was even ever mentioned. Now, Carly, you also have made it very clear that you had this very warm and supportive family unit and mm -hmm. camping was a part of your lives. Um, was tick checks and, and, and the process that you should take if you were to find a tick ever discussed um, as part of your camping experience? Yeah, thinking back to it, my my mom uh, would would check us a lot, um, especially if we were in the woods or uh, like our ankles and our legs. Like that was like the most of the part that we would just kind of check really quick. Um, but there was never it was never for a concern of something with like chronic Lyme. It was just like oh, we just don't want to have you know we want to make sure that there's no ticks. But it was never of a concern that because we would get really sick, it was just for you know, the bullseye and lime of what we knew. And no one really in Connecticut at that time or anyone surrounding me ever really talked about how, how that could affect you and really impact your life. So Carly, what year were you born in? 1990. Now, don't you think it's kind of strange that, uh, that the Lyme pattern um, or cluster was discovered in Lyme, Connecticut in 1975, and you were born decades after that was discovered, yet there was no educational or cultural training that you received as a student in um, the Connecticut educational system? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean... Now, 
do you, re- do you recall ever having been bitten by a tick during your childhood? Not during my childhood. Maybe more. Well, yeah, I, I remember being bit like twice when we were camping, but it was more, it was never something we had to pull off. It was kind of just like, maybe it wasn't bit. I remember them being on me, um, like on my ankles, um, couple in Connecticut. And I actually found one when I first moved to Atlanta, which is crazy because people are like, oh, there's no ticks down there. Or they probably, you know, ticks don't have Lyme disease anywhere else but Connecticut or, you know, up in those states. Um, so, so a couple times I remember like getting them off or pulling them off. So Carly, now you're this hard charging, driven young woman who has plans to work in the entertainment field, professional athlete. You are, you are working really hard to achieve your goals. And when now looking back, did the symptoms of your tick disease begin to present themselves and how did that impact the pursuit of your dreams? So it's, it's hard to say exactly when or what symptoms were from Lyme, which I know talking to a lot of people, that's pretty common. Uh, there, when I first moved to New York, uh, right after college, uh, I actually was working in the television industry. I first interned uh, on The Late Show with David Letterman, and that's kind of where I really got into uh, working television and my dreams were coming true, and that's like what I was striving for. Uh, and then after college, I worked for MTV show made where we were making people's dreams come true. Uh, we were taking someone who wanted to be something and then, uh, training them and, you know, doing a show about them, which was like very related to what I was doing at that time. Um, and it's hard to say exactly what it was. Cause when I first moved to New York for that, it was a high stress, you know, entertainment industry television is just really fast paced. And I had a lot of digestive issues. I had a lot of fatigue. So I always think back, like, was that Lyme? Is that where it started? Was it before then? I never really saw the bullseye like a lot of people. I never really was like, oh my God, this, you know, this bite is swelling up. Like I saw a couple ticks here and there. This was before Atlanta. So um, that's hard to say. And I saw a ton of doctors for that. You know, they told me it was IBS. It was all that stuff. And, and I'm not sure if that's what it was through diet then is where I kind of managed those symptoms. Um, But when I was 24 in Connecticut still, um, through those years after college, junior, senior year of college, I was training, as I mentioned before, um, to be an NFL cheerleader. It's all I wanted to do. It was like blinders on. um, And I was training sometimes two times a day. I was wearing my body down. Um, I was like, changing my diet just to lose weight. It wasn't about being healthy. Um, And there was just a ton of stress. On top of that, it was all mental. I mean, every time I would do an audition, it would just be that much more wearing on me. Um, I did this for five years and uh, I made, I, I would always make it to like the last round and they would announce the team and I wasn't on it, which was just like a hard, it was a hard realization and a hard, it took a hard toll on me on just like my emotional state and my mental state. And a lot of that just like brought out these symptoms and it's hard to say like, did that stress start it? Um, so when I was 24, it was kind of like in the middle of that journey. I had all these like weird fatigue symptoms, stomach like bloating. Um, and I was stressed because I was like, I, I can't feel this way. I need to be training. So I was going to see a naturopath doctor. They first found all these ANA tests, not knowing what that was, you know, these positive ANA tests, like what's going on? Is there autoimmune? Um, got a bunch of tests done. Uh, they always think it's like lupus, usually when there's ANA and that came back negative. And then uh, we tested for Lyme and that came back positive. Now being in Connecticut, it is odd that it wasn't like, oh, this may be a, a chronic thing that you're feeling this way. We were like, oh, I guess we just get antibiotics and let's you know take care of it. So I took uh, Doxy for a few weeks, which probably isn't even long enough for that. And I think that was just enough to just like let the Lyme kind of go back into hiding uh, or at least go dormant. Cause then I felt better for a bit, went back to my training, worked out twice a day, um, went to dance classes, anything I needed to do. And then 
you know, long story short on that, uh, I got, I started to get really sick again. So like in the next two years. So let's, let's take a moment to just focus on that time in your life where you were putting your body under as much stress as you were under. And now the symptoms are beginning to present themselves, but just, just for context. So as a child, you remember having ticks, finding ticks on you, but you don't remember a tick biting you. And then of course you have another experience with ticks where you are bitten by a tick in Atlanta, but we're not in Atlanta yet. We're, we're in that mm -hmm. window between your childhood in Connecticut where you find ticks crawling on you, but you don't remember one biting you, but before your tick bite in Atlanta. And now you're, again, this hard charging driven young woman who's trying to accomplish a goal and you're under a lot of stress. You're under a lot of stress physically because you're training so hard. Mm -hmm. You're under a lot of st stress physically because you're dieting not for health, but for appearance. Mm -hmm. And you're having some struggles with achieving your goal of ultimately becoming a cheerleader, you're sort of getting right up to the line. And then you don't get to cross the finish line. And emotionally, that's having its toll on you. So you have sort of a totality of events coming together where you're under a lot of stress and now your symptoms begin to present, correct? Correct, yep. Okay. Yep, so. So now, now you take your doxy after you go to the doctor, you have your, your first uh, Lyme disease test, it tests positive. Um, even though growing up in Connecticut, you didn't really know a lot about Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. and you didn't know that all of these stressors that you were putting your body under were now going to probably be something it would be wise of you to change. You go back to living this high stress yeah. life. You're training again, you're dancing again, you're, you're, um, you're not eating well again, and you go forward for the next two years trying to accomplish your goals, but putting your, your body under a lot of stress. Yes. So talk to us about how your symptoms were developing as you were continuing to live this high stress life. Yeah. So with auditions, uh, they, you know, started with teams around where I lived and always getting to the last round and not making it. I was like, let me try other teams. So that's when I started to travel too. traveling takes a toll, a lot of stress too, but I was traveling um, I was also working it, as a server in a restaurant really late nights. I was up to like three or four in the morning, um, tr you know, working so that I could pay so I could travel for auditions. Like I said, I was very driven. <laughs> um, and that's kind of where I landed in Atlanta or at least in the Southeast for teams around here. Um, so I was auditioning here and for the, that was probably on the more of the tail end of of that journey of auditioning where I was traveling and I had a cousin who lived here who I'm very close with um, in Atlanta. So I, when I moved down here and auditioned, I was staying with her. Um, I had been doing this for, at this point, four years and I was really tired of moving around. I said, I'm just gonna stay in Atlanta. At this point, my symptoms weren't terrible. I still had like that digestive issues. Um, I still had fatigue, but none of the symptoms that really brought me to um, pushing for like more tests. Um, so when I came to Atlanta, I did a couple more teams and same exact thing happened. Uh, now when you audition, it's, it's weeks because there's so many rounds and there's like boot camps and different things like that. So they were long, uh, like you know, long audition periods. And then to the last round didn't make it. And, uh, again, it would just be this, like, not good enough. Why, you know, why didn't I make it? This is, I've been working for it. That whole thing is just like piling on in my head or internally. Uh, and when I came to Atlanta, the last time I was like, all right, I'm just going to like take a step back for a bit. Um, I ended up, you know, being like, I'm just going to have like, I want to have fun. Like I've just been grueling. I didn't go on a spring break when I was in college. I just want to have a little fun. I came to Atlanta. I was going to music festivals. Um, that's, I was staying up late. I was just like having a ton of fun. And that's when I got hit by like a ton of bricks. Um, my symptoms just flared like crazy. I was also having this just internal battle of like, not good enough. You are, you know, like, when are you gonna make this team and just this pile on? I auditioned 13 times. So this was like a ton of, uh, 
a ton of stress on my body and my mental state. So the symptoms that came up were the weird, I have, I had a really weird symptom that not a lot of people had, but my neurological symptoms in my eyes. Um, I first started dating my now husband when we just recently got married. Uh, and congratulations. Thank you. It's almost a year. October will be a year. Um, but we, uh, we would go on dates and I remember very vividly not being able to keep my eyes open. The, my eyes would just want to shut and I would have to like work really hard to keep them open. And it was like all the neurological symptoms were going crazy and I couldn't think straight. Um, I couldn't retrieve words. Uh, the aches and pains just started happening in my body. And I was like, what is going on? Um, and luckily throughout my life, my grandfather was very uh, forward thinking in like the, you know, in medicine and he wasn't a doctor, but he was always just big about like natural and, and more like, uh, like Eastern medicine and all of that. And we were very open to it. So actually growing up, I was going to a naturopath for a long time since I was like 13 years old. So I always had that idea. However, you know, when you're sick like that, a lot of times you're just like, oh, I'm going to go to the doctor, you know, I'm going to go to my primary care. Of course they had no idea, <laughs> literally no idea. Um, and I was getting ready to audition one more time, um, here in Atlanta. So I was like, you're enough getting training. I was feeling like absolute crap. You know, my, I couldn't keep my eyes open. I couldn't run for more than a couple minutes, uh, without getting really tired and, uh, I was, yeah, I was just like feeling so terrible. And finally I was just like talking to people, I think at a job and someone was like, you should go see my friend who's a functional medicine doctor. That's when I went to her and was like, please, something is going on. I don't care how much this costs. I need every test that you can possibly run, like every single test. And she did, she ran every test possible. I mean, there was like pages and pages and pages of, of everything. And, and it's, when uh when i was thinking about this this story you know for this podcast i was trying to remember like all the tests and i can't i can't even remember like what test she took um and i had to even ask her like like what lime test did we take because <laughs> it feels like so long ago and i remember like first hearing that it was lime i was like oh my god like chronic lime because i just had a cousin who went through the most grueling lime chronic lime journey um, like I had ever heard of at that point where she was a marathon runner and literally couldn't get out of bed, like could not stand. She had two little kids and my whole family was like rocked by this because none of us from Connecticut, she was from Connecticut, we all were, knew that Lyme could be like that. And she was a marathon run, runner and winner. Like she was hardcore. We're very alike in being very driven and perfectionist. Uh, she's a middle child too. And uh, everyone was just really concerned about her. Like I said, our family was just, we were all, we always went in family reunions camping. So that's where we think she got it too. So I knew she had chronic Lyme and was healing it for about a year or actually I think it might've been two years. Um, she might correct me when she hears this cause I can't remember. But when I got diagnosed and I remember being like, oh my God, I saw her go through all of this. Like I, it was, it was like terrifying. It was when that test came back positive. And Carly, at this point now, you get your positive blood work back with your naturopath down in Georgia. What were your next steps to start to treat the chronic Lyme disease? Yeah, so when we, so we got that test back, um, I just remember her saying like, if a Lyme test like this can be, like this is the most positive it can be. Like every single thing was as positive it could be, as high as it could be. Um, and every single other test came back perfect. And I remember her saying like, as, I, as she was pulling the pages, she's like, I was like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to figure out what's wrong with her. Like she was even getting concerned of like, what's going on. And I guess the Lyme test takes a while to get back. It was the last one. And she was like, like, bingo, this has to be it. She was very aware of chronic Lyme. She, I was too at that point, like I said. So the first thing that we did was get on herbs. I had this idea that I just like, didn't want to go antibiotics. Like I was just in New York when I had those GI issues. Um, I was just on like four rounds of antibiotics for just like sinus infections and stupid things like that. And um, 
uh, I, that I think tore up my system so much. And so I had this in my head that I just didn't want to do antibiotics. And she was like, I mean, we can do docs you can do around of this. And I was just like, I really don't want to. And I watched my cousin treat a lot with herbs. Um, I was just very lucky that I had her to lean on um, and to ask, you know, for advice and see what she did. Um, she was seeing some amazing doctors in DC, even though she was in Atlanta, she was, you know, didn't know what was going on and was traveling to DC to see some doctors there. And so she was getting like the best of the best advice. But with my functional medicine doctor, we started with herbs like cat's claw. I remember that one specifically. And again, I, it's so weird because I don't even remember all the herbs I started with because it feels so long ago, even though it was only like four years ago. And I'm just like, wait, what did I do? Because so many people with Lyme will know you do a billion things. So I'm like, well, what did I start with? I do remember that I did cat's claw to start with. There's a couple other herbs that I honestly don't remember, but the biggest part was changing my diet, not for, you know, being skinny or feeling, you know, being fit or, or for cheering and dancing. Um, it was for inflammation. And that was like the biggest piece because um, my inflammation markers were so high that it was about changing my diet right away. And that's where I, I knew a ton about um, eating really healthy because of my auditioning and um, really working out. I actually went to a uh, personal training program. So I was personal training certified through NASM. So I was like very knowledgeable about like how to eat and nutrition and, and health in the body and all of that. Um, so now it just switched to, to learning about how to eat to reduce inflammation. So I changed my diet right away, like no gluten, no dairy, no soy, no sugar. Um, and that wasn't for a lot of people. I know that's like a really harsh change and it's really tough. I'm so lucky that for me, I was already doing a lot of that. Um, but my, my focus was somewhere else. It wasn't for healing. It was for like, you know, being thin and being skinny. And I knew like, Oh, well, if I cut out gluten and carbs, that would happen. And I remember specifically my roommate at that time, when I got diagnosed, she was like, wow. She's like, that's so crazy. Like you were already eating this way. It's almost like your body was telling you that it wanted you to do this. Um, I just wasn't as strict. And so now I was like, okay, well, I already know how to do all this. I'm just going to switch to this full time. Like I had already been doing like whole 30 and all that stuff again to lose weight. But now I was like, well, I can do this now for a more important reason to me. And it's, it's to like, you know, save my life, like be so that I can get my life back. So eating was, and, and diet was probably like the number one on top of all the different herbs we did, you know, with that doctor. So Carly, so many of your symptoms indicate late stage Lyme disease from the high ANA levels, your high inflammation levels, chronic fatigue, your GI issues, your chronic sinus infections. And we know that late stage one generally isn't cured by a short course of antibiotics. So did your naturopath in Connecticut or any doctor up until your naturopath in Georgia ever indicate your symptoms could be related to chronic Lyme and that the antibiotics that you received weren't adequate enough to treat your initial Lyme disease? Not a, no, not at that point in Connecticut. We didn't, we didn't know that. And, and that it's not to say the naturopath didn't know. Cause now I think now she does and she would, she would treat, I mean, she's amazing. She treated my whole family, but for some reason, we just never thought it was chronic. And it's, it is kind of crazy when, when I like tell the story and I've written about this story that I did was like, oh, cause people are like, when were you diagnosed? I was like, actually 2014, but we didn't know. So yeah, I mean, it just tells, tells the point that like, this is not known, especially in Connecticut, which is crazy. And the fact that, uh, in Atlanta, like my functional medicine doctor was, was treating it as chronic. Like I mentioned, I did have a little background with my cousin, um, but she knew it wasn't like she dismissed it, which a lot of doctors would, would completely not know and be like, oh, was, you know, here's more antibiotics. Like you're crazy. This is not something that's chronic. We're not going to treat this with herbs. My functional medicine in a doctor in Atlanta knew, and she knew about cat's claw and those herbs that really will target, uh, you know, the bacteria. So Carly, talk to us about your symptoms in 2016 when you got diagnosed with chronic Lyme. Put it in perspective for us, how sick were you? Were you able to work? Were you able to drive? Were you able to perform daily life functions? Yeah, so I, I find myself very, very lucky. I think that a big part of why my symptoms never got to the really severe stage was my diet. And it's really 
interesting to look back on eating for not specifically um, healing, but still eating in a more healthier way, I think just really saved me. Cause I can look at my cousin who was a marathon runner, as I mentioned, and she was eating pasta and just like, you know, carb loading. And we, she didn't, we really at that point didn't have like the idea of like eating gluten-free or any of that. It just, we were like exposed to it. But, um, but I was through like my studies and through literally just wanting to uh, be thinner. And uh, my symptoms at that point um, were again, the eyes. So I like couldn't really open my eyes. I couldn't concentrate. That would go into my brain. I couldn't really think straight. I was some, I felt super foggy. Um, the, the joint pain. So my hips and knees were terrible. So I couldn't really work out anymore and I couldn't train. Um, and at that point, as I mentioned before, I was signed up for this, uh, program where I was going to train with someone one-on-one for the next audition season. And because my symptoms were so bad, I couldn't work out. I think I went to like one training session with her and I just couldn't, I had no endurance. I couldn't go for more than like five minutes. And I remember coming home to my boyfriend at the time, um, which is now my husband and, and saying like, I, I, I have to like tap out this, this round. And that was just like devastating. Um, just be, you know, this had stopped me from going to that dream. Now we can get into this later. I think that was all lesson half and perfect, but, um, yeah, I, I did work. I'm very lucky. Um, but I also had a job that was like very understanding because when that first happened, I was doing these treatments that were really, uh, stirring things up and, you know, I was herxing and I was feeling really terrible. So if I was to go in late, like, they were fine with that. They knew um, that I was going to see a doctor a lot. I didn't really tell a lot of people details, but um, just that, you know, I was taking care of something and um, I was really lucky, but I did get to work the whole time. Um, I really didn't have, I, I mean, I, I had to. Um, and then a lot of times though, like I, I, you know, had to stay in mom. My husband is actually a music producer. So he DJs and we our lifestyle was very much going out, staying really late, going to shows. Um, and I, and I had to bow out a lot of those, like, you know, everyone would be like, where's Carly? You know, she's not feeling good. It was always, she's not feeling good. Um, and that kind of, you know, it makes you feel insecure a bit. People are just gonna be like, Oh, you know, why is she always sick? And she's always sick. And that was kind of, I started to get insecure about that. It's like, Oh, it's Carly. She's always not feeling good, even though I looked fine. Um, so the symptoms, like the fatigue was the worst, the eyes, the joint pain, um, but, and headaches a ton because of the eye and neurological symptoms. So Carly, I think the, the stress of not being able to show up for your friends and family is mm-hmm. also makes Lyme so much worse because now it's putting a, a mental stress on you, which is making your physical condition even worse, right? So talk yeah. to us about when you first started the herbs and what that was like. Did you start herxing immediately? Did you not really feel much of anything? What What was that beginning of your treatment period like for you? Yeah, I think because I had never treated something or had treated it before, um, the herxing was pretty bad. I remember everybody being like, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but a treatment I did right after that was where I think I was probably in the most herxing pain. I had gone to more of like a Lyme specific specialist because my functional medicine doctor found that it was Lyme. She knew how to treat it, but she wasn't a super specialist in it. So uh, we talked about going to see um, someone in Atlanta who was, um, they were more of like a homeopathic type doctor, um, still with like herbs and treating it that way. And that's where I was herxing, where I couldn't get out of bed probably for like those first maybe like month or two when I was starting that protocol. Um, and there I was, I think I was training with mono, uh, treating it with monolaurin. Um, and there was a ton of other supplements and I was using their ozone saunas and that was making me herx a ton too. And that was the idea of like, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't able to show up for my friends. I wasn't able to do things. Um, I was, you know, dating someone for about two years, but still it's really hard to, you know, 
it's it's so hard to not get concerned that they're going to be like, oh, I didn't sign up for this, right? Like this person's always sick. We can't have fun like we used to. Um, that's that always took a huge toll. Uh, relationships do a ton, you know, talking to people, it's probably one of the most devastating parts. Um, but especially when you're, you know, have like a partner that you're with that is, you just can't show up for, and that you always are like, I don't feel good. Um, and then they have to kind of wait on you. And, and when you're sick, you know, with like a cold or the flu or anything, you know, that's going to end. But for this, like you, you have no idea and you have no idea if it's going to be a good day or, you know, what the bacteria is going to do. But Carly, I think that speaks very positively of both you and your husband, because the fact that you were able to get through this into where you are today shows that you were able to communicate properly with your husband and he was able to receive that and, and strengthen your bond as a result of that and ultimately get married later on in your, in your life, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Yeah, he, I, he is, uh, or, I mean, he's an angel in my life. No, I don't think anyone else could get through this with me. And I don't, I think he is a huge part of my healing. Um, he is, I guess when we get to healing, it gets a bit more, but um, I've never met someone more positive in my life. Uh, he never has a negative thought in his life. And here I am coming from, you know, being so down on myself for not getting my dream, not being able to be, you know, quote unquote, good enough. Um, I was just in this like negative swirl in my brain. And, and here's this person who came to my life who literally, one of the first things he told me was change the way you look at things, the things you look at change by Wayne Dyer. And I mean, he completely changed my life on positive thinking and um, just being like that rock for me. And I'm just so lucky that I was with someone who was able to help me through this. I know everyone's not as lucky, you know, with a partner like that, but having someone, a support system and a rock like that, I mean, completely saved me from, um, from how worse it could have gotten, especially like having that added stress of someone not supporting you. Having a support system is just like one of the biggest pieces in healing. Carl, I think you need to recognize that you were a big piece of that as well, because no matter how supportive your husband was, you had to be open to it. And many people that yeah. are sick with Lyme just sort of close themselves out and aren't open to any sort of feedback or communication or relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a two-way street in that area. So you got to look and, and give yourself some credit as well for that. But I want to talk more about your ozone sauna because you were doing the herbs, yeah. which were killing a lot of bacteria, making you hurt because you weren't feeling so well. And now the ozone sauna, really the idea behind that is you're sweating out the detox method, right? To sweat out some of the toxins, but the ozone as well actually kills some of the bacteria too, I believe. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, it does. That was a pretty intense uh, protocol. It's a really scary, large machine where only your head is sticking out. It was very claustrophobic. Um, I did it a couple times and I actually, uh, because I was so sick at that point, I think the first couple of times I had to stop early because I was getting really lightheaded and had to lay down. Like, I mean, I was, when I was doing that, I was pretty, I was herxing pretty bad. The bacteria was like rearing pretty bad. I didn't, that wasn't probably like my main, um, my main like healing modality. I mean, so many people listening to this uh, with Lyme and, and many people I talk to can relate and I'm sure you can relate. You do a billion things. Like it's, it's like the discovery of all the healing modalities and what's going to work and what resonates with you and what you see the most uh, improvement on. Um, so yeah, so the ozone wood uh, goes in and, and, uh, kills the bacteria as you're sweating it out. I think that helped a ton. I did it a few times, but the biggest piece for me was, um, was the hyperbaric oxygen tank. So I, um, with Lyme, like a lot of people, um, mold comes with it. So without getting into that story too much, I was in a moldy apartment when I first moved to Atlanta. Um, I've had asthma my whole life. I had two asthma attacks while I was in that apartment. Um, again, didn't really think anything of it. And that could also, you know, spurred up these symptoms. Um, there's so many layers to it. But when I was kind of looking up, you know, getting really into Lyme, mold keeps popping up with these people. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I forgot that I had that. So I was kind of looking into what people really found successful with Lyme. And then hyperbaric kept popping up from mold also. So it's like, why not? Let me test this out. Um, 
I went and tested it out and then I loved how it made me feel. I did the mild one. I know a lot of people say that you have to do more of a deep dive to kill bacteria. I've heard both sides. I did like a ton of research, but the mild worked for me. And I ended up doing that for about three months. I actually rented a unit and had it in my small little apartment. This giant thing, people would come over and be like, is that a spaceship? Like, and I'm, you know, my husband's like, oh, that's just, you know, it's Carly's healing stuff. So I would do that um, every day, sometimes twice a day um, and take like hour dives. And so it just, you know, brings the pressure down and uh, pumps in pure oxygen. And then that would also be just like my meditation time too. And after those three months, I think that's when I probably saw like the biggest improvement. Um, but there's like, I mean, I have a whole list of modalities that I did that I think kind of helped. It's kind of just like, you know, filling a bucket with water a little at a time, just kind of adding up to um, have to create, to create an environment in your body where disease can't live. And so I, that, that was always like the biggest part, um, the biggest thing I repeat in my mind is like, okay, how can I create this environment? Like, what can I do to, um, to help my body? Carly, you're doing all the right things. You, you were doing the diet initially, but you got even stricter with your diet to help induce an environment where your body is going to fight off the, the bacteria on its own. You're also mm -hmm. taking the herbs to help yourself detox and also kill off the bacteria. You did the ozone sauna, which was tough, but really helped you in your journey. And now you finally started the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And a lot of our, a lot of our followers and a lot of people in Lyme support groups that we've been in are interested in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but they're afraid of it because the common thing we hear often is people are very claustrophobic and you have mm -hmm. to, I guess, let it decompress before you get out. And if somebody starts to have anxiety, they're stuck. So what advice would you give our listeners that want to learn more or want to use hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but are afraid to use it based on your experiences? So I am actually not a claustrophobic person. However, um, I think for anyone, it's it, when you're in that tank. So there, there's different sizes. The first advice I'd give is if you are claustrophobic, you'd probably want to go in a bigger, um, a bigger unit. It, it will help you just have more room, feel more in control. The other part is like, you want to know exactly what's going on. So when I first did it, I didn't rent it myself. I didn't want to do that at first because I wanted someone right there with me. Um, so I actually went to this chiropractor office here that had one. Um, she was just like, um, more of like a natural, like homeopathic, um, type of chiropractor and she had one in, in the room. So she was right there next to me. She was healing. Uh, she had mold toxicity. So she was using that and she was there with me the entire time. So I told her I was really nervous. And again, I'm not really claustrophobic, but being in there and having someone like zip you in something like that, it's all mental. I mean, it's all what you're telling yourself. Um, and I had, I had her there with me, had her walk me through it. Like, how can I get out myself? Um, and just being more in control. Honestly, I always tell people that the first, uh, maybe like two or three times I did it, I was actually pretty nervous for that same reason. It's really mental. Like you're, you're zipped in this tiny little compartment. Um, I actually first talked to my sister on the phone the whole time and just, I was like, talk to me so I can get through this. And it's just getting used to it. Um, like the biggest piece of advice is, uh, is really to get in that mental state. And then I would listen to like meditation music and I would close my eyes and just deep breathe. Cause I, then I'm like, I don't know where I am. And that person was going to help me get out of it. And she would check in on me every 15 minutes and you know, giving her a thumbs up through the little window there. Um, it's, it's really just being in control, learning about it, kind of pushing through those first like three or four sessions where you'll get used to it and it'll be a breeze after that. And then I was able to literally put myself in and out of it um, but it's totally normal to feel that way. Um, I did completely the first couple of times and I didn't think I would cause I'm usually not very claustrophobic. Um, but it was just a huge part of my healing and it's just, you know, finding that support, someone who's going to watch you or someone you can talk on the phone with. Um, after I was used to it, I turned Wi-Fi off and all that and kind of, uh, put my phone away. But for, for those first few times, it's really finding support and feeling in control. So Carla, you're giving us so many golden, what I call Lyme hacks to help yourself heal and recover, uh, physical, uh, emotional, and, and one of them I think is social because you talked about how your husband was there to support you. And now you mentioned that you have your sister as well to help you get through the initial fear of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So I think a big takeaway from what you're saying is people that are suffering with Lyme have to be more open about it with the people that, that are in their families and that they trust and that they love. 
so that, that those people can help them get through their journeys. And many, many people don't open up about their Lyme experiences. So do you think that that was an important part of your, your healing journey? Yes, completely. Um, it can be and feel very isolating, um, especially when people don't understand you don't look sick. Uh, there's, I remember a lot of times, I mean, even kind of recently, sometimes that creeps up of just like, I feel really alone. Like I don't have any, you know, there's no one in my direct life. I'm very lucky to have my cousin who understands completely, as I've mentioned, but you know, my husband and my, and my direct or immediate family, um, they are the most understanding people. I'm so lucky uh, to have that support system. But as you said, it, I, it, you have to be open to it, but I still get those bouts of feeling really alone and just kind of feeling lost because it's like, you know, they don't know exactly what it feels like. Like my husband still doesn't know exactly what that pain is like. And sometimes it can be really confusing still. Um, and it's been like a really big learning experience for both of us, but it is really confusing on, on just like, oh, I felt fine like an hour ago. And then all of a sudden I don't. Um, but yeah, being more open to accepting support and then talking about it and trying to, um, teach, teach others about it, um, in your, you know, close circle is really important. But a big part of that for me was just being really positive because, uh, in that state, if, if you're not like, it is hard, but it's hard to be open about it. If it's, if you're in just more of that kind of like dark cloud negative uh type of feeling and it's so hard to not be i mean that was probably it's it's the hardest part of it is to not get stuck in that and uh, other than the physical healing modalities such as you know the hyperbaric and i mean i've done a ton of other ones acupuncture and saunas and parasite cleanses enemas like all that stuff the biggest part was my mindset meditation, Reiki, energy work, uh, that has completely changed my life, can change my healing life and changed my life in general. If I didn't have that and if I didn't turn to that and learn about that, then I would not be able to be open to people or able to be, you know, the where I am today in my healing. I mean, energy work was, and, I, and mindset is for me like the number one uh, reason why I was able am able to heal and feel better. Probably talk to us more about that. You mentioned Reiki and a whole bunch of other things you did to get your mindset straight. So what would you recommend to those people that are listening to this that are struggling with their, their mental health state? Because Lyme really is crippling physically, mm -hmm. which makes you feel horribly mentally, right? So what yep. would you recommend to them to help calm down their mind and be more open about their experience and, and to have more peace about their healing journey? Yeah, so I don't I don't want to make this sound like it's it's really easy for people listening to this because it's not just an idea of like, oh, I'm just gonna think positive or oh, I'm just gonna turn to this. It is a constant battle back and forth. Now I'm as uh you guys have heard the story, I have at this point I am in a in my mind, I do not think very like highly of myself because of all that I went through with auditions. I had just a low self-worth. I felt like I wasn't good enough. Um, being a middle child, as I talked about, and when I, was, when I brought up all the anxiety from when I was little, had an amazing childhood, the best. But when I talked about that anxiety, I was kind of pulling it towards this on, um, there was just, I kind of always had that more, like I would always like lean more to the negative. Like that's just how I, um, my brain would, would function. I was a very happy kid. And, but, but it, I kind of would always just like worry a ton um, and just have that anxiety. So for me, I was in this place and I think a lot of the, that negativity and stress also brought this up. Um, I knew that this was an opportunity to work on that. I mean, it, it was a huge, huge door of just to open to be like, this is the time to heal all this, to heal this like emotional trauma and um, you know, not getting my goals and like what I thought about myself. And that was like the biggest hurdle. So it's not easy to just change your mindset and just think positive, you know, like that. So anyone listening to this who feels like, you know, they're in that more just, you know, tough space and it feels like a dark cloud. 
it's not just going to be overnight where you feel better. It's an up and down, uh, you know, one day you're like, I feel great. I'm going to think positive. Like, this is awesome. Be better. And then you're back to down thinking that. And it's the practice of just like adding that like step by step by step and um, just turning inward. So I went to go see energy healers. Um, and when I say that, it was, I actually went to go see this uh, doctor who did like a bioresonance scan, um, which is another part of my healing, but a lot of that's like emotional scans. So um, it's this uh, machine where you hold these rods and now I'm not going to go science and I probably won't say it right, but basically it kind of like scans your body for energy and the, the computer literally tells you on what you need to work on like emotionally and then also does like physical stuff too. But um, a lot of that came up and through that, she's uh, an amazing energy worker and we would just dive into uh, inner child work and just really like figure out what was like, what was blocking me because I knew that this wasn't all physical. I was looking back and, and knowing that I just went through all these auditions and all these goals that weren't happening and I had to give it up. And I knew that every time I talked about my dream and auditioning, I would cry like at like a, like a drop of a pen. I would just cry because it was like this wound that was still really open and I didn't have closure with it. And so I was like, obviously like this is weighing so hard on my um on my body and my healing and i and i had to like i had to face this so um i dove really deep into that i did breath work um to kind of work through a lot of that emotional trauma which is which is a pretty intense energy healing when you're um when you're doing like you know breath work like a lot of stuff comes up I did Reiki actually and Reiki certified. So um, I was kind of just like researching and diving into anything. Um, I was uh, trained in this uh, specific type of like transcendental type meditation. Um, and I knew that this was gonna be really important. A big piece of it, my husband's very into um, meditating. I think he meditates like every single day. And he was a big part of pushing me to figure out what was going and going on and knowing that if I changed my mind and my thoughts that my reality would change. And this was just like a huge, huge part, um, emotional freedom tapping, uh, and just, just like meditating and just like journaling and figuring out what was going on. Like what, like what was this? And that is like the greatest lesson of my life is being able to do that. And I have, have people, I think like one of my friends told me the other day when we were going on a walk, she's like, wow, you're different. Like, it just create like, I'm teaching this to people now. Like I'm teaching this positive thinking to people. And it took me, I mean, this was like this, when I really started diving into the more emotional mindset part. Um, I mean, this was probably like two, two years and it, it takes a long time. So Carly, it, it just sounds like you've done such a large amount of things to help yourself heal emotionally and mentally and physically. Right. But a lot of these things you mentioned, like bioresonance and Reiki, they're things that aren't commonly talked about. So if somebody listening mm -hmm. wants to learn more, can they DM you on Instagram at the link we're going to put in the show notes, just so you can point them in the right direction as to how to learn more about a particular area you mentioned to heal emotionally or mentally? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is this is my, my favorite part of it. I love helping people, pointing people in the direction of that. And the emotional mindset part of it is is what I love helping people to teach. Um, so absolutely, anybody can reach out, ask me. I would love to point to this stuff. This is the kind of stuff that you only really hear and learn about through other people. So it's just really powerful to be able to talk to people, to point them in those directions and, and know what, there are, what other options are out there. So Carly, I just have to tell our audience that before we started this interview, you mentioned that you were a little concerned because you might have Lyme brain. But yeah. <laughs> you did not have Lyme brain at all, which is leading to my next question. I mean, you sound great. You are, you've explained everything very well. And I think you've just given us so, information that's, so much information that's going to help everybody listening to this podcast. We want to thank you for that, which really leads us to my final question before handing over to Rich is, how do you heal today? And how would you assess your health today? So today, I would say I'm probably about 80% there. Um, I, I say that because I'm, I have good days and bad days. And I, that's a huge thing with people, uh, the Lyme community, no good days and bad days. 
However, like I said, I just had a, you know, a friend tell me the other week that she could see like such a change in just like my attitude and positivity and that I was teaching her the things that I was learning and it really hit me. It's like, that's why I'm, I'm feeling that way. Now there's so much more supporting it. So it's not, you know, it's not just to live a lifestyle of eating bad foods and not supporting your body and not detoxing and just thinking positive. Um, I'm doing all those things. And on top of that, really keeping my mind, uh, always going back to the positive every time I feel a negative thought, switching it. So, I mean, these days I would say there, there's still the times where, um, I feel my joints start aching, but then I know how, I know what to do. Like I know that I need to detox or I know that I'm stressing my body too much. Um, I mean, my life has changed to where I can't do things as much. I don't work out as much, but that's more of a call to like, to take care of my body. Maybe I'm just walking and I'm not stressing and lifting really heavy weights in the gym. I'm just going to do something that's more caring towards my body. So I'm, I'm very lucky that, um, I'm able to still work. Um, and I'm able to, uh, like to function and like, like I want to. And like I said, I do have Lyme brain a little bit. So the one thing that's still there is like that word retrieval. I feel like the brain fog thing is probably one of the things that lasts a lot, really long for a lot of people. Um, but I mean, it goes, it goes up and down. Um, but I'm really lucky that that positivity and the continued work with that every single day, cause that's a lifelong lesson and a lifelong journey, um, has helped me tremendously. And I'm, and I'm really lucky that I, I say I'm probably about 80% there while still supporting my body with the supplements um, and all the detoxing um, and just a really great support system. So Carly, you've begun to share with us during the course of this podcast, all of the beautiful things that have happened to you as a consequence of Lyme. And I always feel awkward about describing the beautiful elements of Lyme, but you've made it easy because you've gone through such a beautiful transformation. And part of your transformation, which is what caused us to discover you, is your outreach on social media. So can you talk to us about uh, what inspired you to begin to reach out to other folks in the Lyme community so that you can share your lessons and your experiences and help folks shortcut their journey? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm definitely a people person. Uh, but on top of that, I'm just like a huge empath. Like I feel for people. I love, I love connecting and helping people. And through the Lyme journey, me discovering that you can really change your life while changing your mindset and and changing your attitude and your thoughts i mean your thoughts literally dictate your entire life it's such a life hack that takes practice but that you just want to like scream from the rooftops and tell everybody about like you just know that they could feel better and have this life that they that they want and that they can have by doing these things and and eating healthier and teaching them how to do that and all the different ways that you can heal and detox. And I gathered all this and learned it from other people. And I want to be able to package it and just show people and point them in the direction. And I, I have talked with a lot of um, people who have, who have reached out to me on social media asking what I do. And I think it's important just to keep sharing it and sharing it that, um, you know, that chronic Lyme is a thing that if you're having these symptoms that you have no idea what's going on to, reach out to a functional medicine doctor or a naturopath doctor who will go beyond just the surface. Someone who knows, you know, is not just going to do the test that they learned in school. They're going to go deeper and they're going to find out what the root of the cause is and they're not going to stop until they find it. So many people are sick and have no idea what's going on or they have these, they have these diagnoses that are just complete BS. So it's, and I have pushed a, a bunch of people just to keep going to doctors and keep digging and keep asking and keep getting tests and figuring out what it is. Um, but I don't think there's anything more important than being there for other people and helping people and being their support system, because I'm so lucky that I had that. I know everyone doesn't have that. And I'm grateful for it every day that I've had my support system. So I want to be that for other people. So lately I've always shown up on social media, you know, really advocating for Lyme, but even um, more so, restarting up my blog uh, a couple months ago, really having a focus on that um, has been really important because 
in our world today, uh, it's not recognized as much as it should be, and especially with how to heal. Um, so I, if I can be, if I can be that light for somebody, then um, that's everything to me. Well, Carly, you are that light for many people, and we are really blessed to um, have you shine some of your light on us and on our listeners. And I'm going to ask you to shine your light in one last way. If, God forbid, tomorrow your husband walked into your bedroom and showed you that he had, tick, he had a tick biting him on his leg, what would you recommend that he do so that he wouldn't have to go on the terrible journey that you had to go on? Yeah, so um, I feel I feel like I do that with a lot of people now where I'm just hyper aware of checking all the time. If he had found one, I mean, I'm always like, let's wear long pants when we go outside. We're going to spray everything. I'm very, you know, uh, proactive about it. But if he had found one now, which actually one of my friends recently did um, and my uncle recently did, we had told them, and I actually had learned about this recently, I think even through some other people who show up on social media with you know, advocating for Lyme, is that you can take the tick and send it off to be tested. And I never knew that. And maybe that was a more open thing. But if you are, I would say, lucky enough to find it, not, not that you have one lucky enough, but to actually see it, because most people don't see a bite. And uh, I mean, get that tested, send it off, get it tested so you know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, now, I was always not wanting to take antibiotics, but if you are first, if you first get that bite, um, going, you know, antibiotics can probably kill that bacteria right away. However, I would tell them to see a functional medicine doctor or see a Lyme literate doctor, someone who knows Lyme specifically so that they can tell you exactly what to do for that first stage because catching it early is everything. It's, you know, when it, when it becomes chronic and when Lyme finds a home and is comfy and in, in your body where it's so hard to uh, get rid of it and, you know, heal as many of you guys know, it's so, it's so important if you're catching it early to just like hop on it, treat it and um, make sure that you are focused on that and not just take it off and, you know, oh, there's not a bullseye, then we won't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Um, get it tested to see exactly what it is, but always treat it as if, as if it could turn into Lyme. Thank you for listening to the Tick Bootcamp interview with Carly Taylor. To our listeners, we have a call to action. If you'd like to learn more about Carly Taylor and her Lyme disease journey, please visit her Instagram page at naturally.carly. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of the post. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick by Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been provided to us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please know we would appreciate any input or improvements you would like to offer to us so we can change and improve the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, please take a minute to leave us an honest review or rating on iTunes or our website. We really thank you for listening.